Leslie for joining us here today. Um, this might come as a bit of a surprise, but I believe he's going to talk about Muskrat Falls. <laughs> so he, may, he may touch on that during his, uh, his speech. So now I'd like to uh, give a brief bio and introduction to the minister. Jerome Kennedy was born and raised in Carboneer, and he graduated from Memorial University in 1981 with a Bachelor of Arts, of course, honors. He attended the University of New Brunswick Law School and graduated in 1984 with an LLB and was admitted to the Newfoundland Bar in 1985. He began practicing criminal law full-time in 89. During his career, Mr. Kennedy practiced at all levels of court, including the Supreme Court of Canada. Prior to his election and subsequent appointments as Minister of Justice and Attorney General, Mr. Kennedy practiced with the criminal law uh, firm Simmons Kennedy in St. John's. On October 31, 2008, Mr. Kennedy was appointed the Minister of Finance, Treasurer, President of the Treasury Board, the Minister Responsible for the Public Service Secretariat, and the Minister Responsible for the Office of the Chief Information Officer. On October 7, 2009, Mr. Kennedy was appointed the Minister of Health and Community Services. Minister Kennedy was re-elected to the House of Assembly on October 11, 2011 and was appointed the Minister of Natural Resources, the Minister Responsible for Forestry and Agri-Foods, and the Government House Leader. Folks, you please join with me in welcoming Minister Jerome Kennedy. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be in uh, Clarenville today to uh, have a talk about Muskrat Falls. Uh, before I do that, though, I certainly want to uh, Welcome my colleagues in the House of Assembly, uh, uh, Ross Wiseman, uh, Sandy Collins, I see Sandy there, and Glenn Little in, in the back. Uh, Ross is now, I, I think, will become the latest uh, judge I'll have to face, because next week in my role as the House Leader, I'll be making objections and raising points of order, which uh, Ross will have to, uh, to rule about. The problem is, though, I have no right of appeal, so whatever his decision is, that, that's it. Uh, also, I see Mayor Fitzgerald here from Bonavista Vista and councillors from the uh, number of towns in the New York area. Uh, good to be here. Uh, before I get to Muskrat, I want to have a quick, uh, provide you a quick update on the uh, Hebron development because it certainly impacts what's going on in, in this whole area. Uh, I met, I've met with the um, Exxon Mobil and a number of uh, interested companies over the last uh, uh, period of time in getting a view as to what's going to take place at Blue Arm. And, uh, this living quarters that's going to be constructed at Bull Arm is quite a, uh, it's quite a structure and it's going to employ a, a lot of people. Uh, we're still looking at ways to have the, uh, the second module uh, built in the province uh, and hopefully uh, we could or possibly see Bill, Bull Arm being used more. So the economic spin-offs to, uh, to the area are, are absolutely <laughs> fabulous as I'm sure you folks all remember so well from, uh, from Hibernia. Also, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, put a plug in here today for, uh, for our CBs in the upcoming series with, uh, <laughs> uh, with Clarville. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> it's it's a four-game series. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's going to be a good series, and uh, of course, I hope the CBs, uh, CBs win. Uh, the uh, Muskrat Falls project was announced in November 2010. Since the announcement, there has been much discussion and debate, and opponents of the project have been uh, very vocal. I would suggest to you that a lot of the, the, uh, the criticism is unfounded and, uh, and simply confuses the issues, although I will concede a lot of valid points have been and are being raised. But the way I'd like for you to think about uh, Muskrat Falls, or the need for Muskrat Falls, is, is quite simple. There are two basic questions. One, do we need the power? And two, if so, what is the lowest cost option? Now, of course, position that we need the power has been confirmed by the recent report of Manitoba Hydro International, an independent uh, company uh, hired by the Public Utilities Board, independent of government and the and Nalcor. And the, and the MHI report did not take into account the need for power with the potential 10 to 15 billion dollars worth of mine developments in, in Labrador, all of which need power. So if we need the power, well, what are our options? One is we can uh, develop Muskrat Falls with Labrador Island Link. 
Two, we can refurbish Holyrood in combination with small wind and hydro. Three, we can develop Gull Island. Or four, we can do nothing. I will also talk uh, a little bit about the option of natural gas because that's been raised. All of us will concede as, as politicians that we would like to develop Gull Island. But it's not an option at present because without access across Quebec, it cannot happen. Four decades of Newfoundland and Labrador politicians have tried to resolve this issue without success. To do nothing is not an option if we need the power. So what are we left with? <coughs> Muskrat Falls or refurbishing Hollywood? The MHR report concludes that Muskrat Falls is $2.2 billion cheaper than the Hollywood option. Muskrat Falls provides us as a government as, and as a people with an opportunity to secure a bright future for our children, and, and we want to do it right. As a government, we will be guided by one simple question. Is Muskrat Falls in the best interest of the people of Newfoundland and Labrador? Now, since I've emphasized so much the need for power, I'm going to touch briefly on why we, we need the power. The island portion of the province has a generating capacity of 1,958 megawatts of power, and Newfoundland and Labrador Hydro provides approximately 75% of that. Holyrood has the capacity to produce 466 megawatts of power, or 31% of the island's power needs. Critics have argued that with the closure of the mills in Stephenville and Grand Falls, the uh, shutdown of a, of a machine in Cornerbrook, and that with the population decline, that we don't need power. Now, that's a superficially, it appears to be a good argument, but let me just put this uh, by you. Even though we have a lower population than we had years ago, we have more people living in homes. We no longer have eight and ten people living in houses like it uh, used to be uh, years ago. Now we have uh, two, a, a couple with two, three, four kids, ever how many kids uh, you have. And there are actually more ratepayers in the province. We have approximately 230,000 ratepayers, but 17,000 new ratepayers since 2005. So even though the argument of population decline is offset by more people paying uh, or buying electricity. Also, the latest census, and although it may not at first glance be, appear to be so significant, we've had a population uh, increase of 1.8%, and high housing starts are at an all-time high. 86% of new homes are using electric heat. We have economic growth leading to commercial and industrial growth, which means that Holywood, which is currently only used at 15 to 25% of the time, will be used more to its full rate of capacity. By 2015, we will start to experience blackouts, it's projected. By 2020, we simply will not have enough power. To put it in perspective, Valley Inca, or the, high, the Long Harbor plant, requires 92 megawatts of power. To run one of these iron ore mines in, in Labrador, it could be from 100 uh, to 150 to, as big as IOC, 250 megawatts of power. So, MHI's report concludes we need the power. But they also say that NALCOR underestimates the need for power. Now, they haven't looked at Labrador. And the estimates we have right now, Muskrat Falls has approximately 824 megawatts of power. 40% will come to the island. 170 megawatts will go to Nova Scotia in return for the, uh, the lake being built and the uh, an investment here in the province. And then we have 40% left, or approximately 300 to 400 megawatts of power. That will go and is available in Labrador for these mining projects. We don't have firm contracts at present because so much depends in the iron ore industry what's happening in China. So I met with uh, IOC, Tata Steel, All Around Resources, Labrador Iron Mines, and they're all indicating that in, they see their projects proceeding. So the need for power is there. What we will do with the 40% extra power, we will sell them spot markets in the, in the Maritimes United States, and then it's available for recall. So this argument that we need, we don't have firm power purchase agreements is not a good one because we don't want firm contracts. We want to be able to recall that power for use in Labrador. So if we need the power, what do we do? The one option that our critics continue to skate around is the need for power. 
And that's why it's very important they always be brought back to that question. Do you accept MHI's report that we need the power? Our, our critics say, well, we haven't looked at all the options. But when we explain what we found, they refuse to accept it. Ed Martin, the president of Nalcor, spoke in great detail yesterday about how, why natural gas won't work. Yet, do you think that will stop the critics? Some of the critics are, are politically motivated, but some have honest beliefs. There's no question about that. They, they, for whatever reason, believe they are right and the experts are wrong. Well, as a government, we rely on experts, not self-professed experts. From a political perspective, it's easy to identify the critics. And it's, uh, some of this will be raised, I can show you, in the House of Assembly next week. But for example, the late Jack Layton supported Muskrat Falls as the leader, the federal leader of the NDP. Former provincial NDP leader and current uh, MP Jack Harris supports the deal. But Lorraine Michael doesn't. The provincial liberals do not support the deal. Yet Yvonne Jones says there's no power for Labrador. Well, where are we going to get it? Yet, would-be leader Dee McDonald supports the project. So the politics in this is very obvious. It's unfortunate that it's broken down along those lines. But I keep saying to them, tell us what we're going to do. Muskrat Falls, to break it down very quickly, $6.2 billion project, $1.2 billion invested by uh, Nova Scotia in building the maritime link. 2.9 billion for the generating station, 2.1 billion for the Labrador Island Lake. Holyrood, small hydro, 77 megawatts of small hydro and wind, up to approximately 80 megawatts of wind, cost $8.8 .8 billion. But the best of the other options is the isolated island alternative, Holyrood in conjunction with small hydro and wind. So when I became minister, uh, I think it was around November 1st, we, I, almost like being a lawyer again. So I'm going to sit here and I'm going to study this. I'm going to prepare this case for, for court. And so we started meeting with experts. So I've traveled to New York a number of times where I met with an oil forecasting company called Pyra uh, and uh, a world energy advisor called Wood McKenzie. And we're consulting these individuals on what's happening with the world because Holyrood becomes so expensive because of the price of oil. At its peak, Holyrood burns 18,000 barrels of oil a day. Dirty bunker sea oil uh, that costs a lot of money. Now, why is oil going to continue to rise, or why do the forecasters to say this? There's not enough supply to meet demand. It's a basic principle. The world burns approximately 90 million barrels of oil a day, with China and the US accounting for approximately 30%. No matter what we do, you're not going to meet that growing demand in China and President Obama gave a speech last week where he talked about uh, the growth in China, India, and Brazil fueling the, uh, the world economy at present. There's continued growth in China and these other BRIC countries, the developing countries, but also the activities in the Middle East. So much of what happens with the price of oil is determined by the Middle East. The global middle class is growing by approximately 80 million people a year. So what we look at is that the price of oil will continue to rise. So electricity rates are going up because we will have to use Hollywood more. MHI looked at, well, what would have to happen for Hollywood to be cheaper than Muskrat Falls? If oil went to $40 a barrel, Muskrat Falls is still cheaper by $120 million than Hollywood. Now, Anyone in this room who thinks that oil is going to 40, and now I suppose you should never say never because we've seen some amazing things happen, but it's very unlikely, based on what the experts will tell us, that oil is going to $40 a barrel in the next number of years. There would have to be a capital cost of a 50% overrun. I'll talk about overruns in a second. Even then, Muskrat Falls is cheaper, and Holyrood, or excuse me, Cornerbrook Public Paper would have to close and allow for 124 megawatts of power to go into the grid and there would have to be an overrun on the project. One very significant point that MHI raised that the first time I saw it was that Holywood may not last till 2041 because it's an old facility and you can only extend the life of this <coughs> facility so long. Now, all of us, and I'll talk in a while about the Upper Churchill, but we're all afraid of repeating what took place in 1967, 68, 69. So we're looking at a major project, and, and Ross has sat around the cabinet table with me, and we haven't been very good as a government in judging overruns. 
one of the reasons of setting up Nalcor as a private company, of course, with Newfoundland and Labrador taxpayers being the only shareholder, was to allow them to run this like a private business. There are inherent risks and uncertainties, but whether or not we build Muskrat Falls, refurbish Holyrood, there are always going to be these uncertainties. What we try to do is mitigate and lessen these uncertainties, and that's why Nalcor goes through a decision gate process that looks at each step of the way how to, to do, uh, do this properly. Now, a lot of you in this room will remember, uh, remember Hibernia. You'll remember the Hibernia, the skepticism. That Hibernia was a make work project. That's all it was. Well, the federal government, and their 8.5% interest in Hibernia has made a lot of money. As a province, we've made a lot of money, and Hibernia has produced more than a billion barrels of oil. Natural gas has been put forward as an option, and there's two ways they can uh, that have been put forward, two options. One is that we build a pipeline from the Grand Banks. We have lots of natural gas out there. I'm not quite sure what 11 trillion feet, cubic feet of gas, how much that really is, but there's another 60 trillion cubic feet out there between uh, our Grand Banks and Labrador. But we build a pipeline and we bring the gas in and build the, uh, and use natural gas to fuel Holyrood. Well, there's a number of basic problems with that. A straight line shows a 350 kilometer pipeline from the Grand Banks to get to Hollywood. Whereas what I'm told is the ice is such that that line could actually be 650 kilometers. Then what we have is a situation where the oil companies have production licenses. We can't say to them, you have to do this. We can work with them. And as an oil executive said to me recently, Oil companies are in the business of making money today. And does anyone honestly think that these oil companies wouldn't be developing the natural gas if it was economically feasible at this point? The price of gas is so low right now that they're not willing to spend the money that's required to develop it. But in, consistent with our energy plan, we will develop that natural gas when the time is right. So that's the first big hurdle. The second one is the importation of natural gas. I, I, I'll keep this fairly simple. But the United States has become an exporter as a result of the shale gas uh, explosion that I think Mr. Martin referred to it yesterday. Uh, the US is now exporting natural gas. But the small amount needed in Hollywood makes us a very small player, and again, volatile to fuel prices. We cannot compete with China and Europe. So that gas that costs $3 in the United States is costing 13 to 16 dollars in China and Europe. And if we start getting caught up in a bidding war with that natural gas, we're simply replacing the volatility of oil with the potential volatility of natural gas. But also, and I don't think, and I, I forget who put this to me one day, we spend approximately 70 percent, I think, of the cost of electricity a day goes to fuel uh, at Hollywood in terms of the burning of oil. That $6 billion that we're going to spend on oil over the next 20, 30, 40 years can be spent in this province. So should we not keep that money in this province as opposed to sending it to big multinational oil companies who are not in our province? We've met with independent experts, market analysts, industry representatives, and some of you will be familiar with Dr. Wade Lodge's report. None of what our critics are saying about natural gas is supported. Wind is a significant component of our, our energy plan. However, wind has to be integrated into the system. And what MHI concluded was that now, of course, assessment that 80 megawatts of wind power into the system by 2025 was reasonable. One thing that the link allows us to do is to develop more wind power and to export it to the Maritimes if and when needed. The small hydro is there, can also at some point in the future be developed. We have three small hydro developments. Uh, that's Round, Round, Pond, Round Pond, Portland Creek, and Island Pond. Again, can be developed when necessary. One comment that has been, I think, uh, very unfortunate over the last period of time, and as a government we, we tried to deal with this, was the, this, the opposition mantra that power rates will double. I can tell you that that is nothing short of a deliberate attempt to mislead the people of this province. 
people are interested, and this is what we heard, and if you talk to any of us here at the election, if Muskrat Falls came up with the main question, what's this going to cost me? What's, what's going to happen to my electricity rates? Are they going to double? Well, doubling to me is very simple. You pay 300 today, well, 600 tomorrow. The numbers are nothing like that. What are seniors? What are single mothers? What are families? What all of us are concerned about is the impact of these, of Muskrat Falls on electricity rates. Very simple. These are based on the average island user out of the 230,000 people who burn 1,517 kilowatt hours of energy a year. And that person paid 2,000, in 2000 paid $135. In 2011, that person will pay $179 a month. Going up to 2016, up to $217 because of the price of oil. Muskrat Falls is scheduled to come online in 2017. Rates will rise. We're projected based on what we know at present, and we will have better numbers in the next few months. We'll go up $15 per month. Over the next 13 years, it will go up another $14 per month. Without Muskrat Falls, if we go with Hollywood, rates will rise three times that. So this has been the kind of distortion that's existed, and it's very difficult at times to combat. So what I've tried to do as, a, as a, the minister is to simplify a very complex issue. Muskrat Falls will stabilize, then reduce electricity rates. Another big concern is the issue of overruns, as I talked about before. Out of the $5 billion that we project at present that Muskrat Falls, the generating station, and the Labrador Island Link will cost, $1 billion is built in for overruns, almost 20%. There's a 15% contingency and an escalation factor. So we know that that's there. we're planning for that contingency. We'll know more in the next few months. But on the other side, there's never been a better time to borrow money for the markets. The federal loan guarantee saves us approximately $500 million as a province. And to any of you business people in the room, a quarter percent or a half percent of $5 billion a lot of money. So the overrun could be offset by savings and financing. The critics say, well, what's the hurry? Why don't we wait till next year? If we do, each year we delay the project, there's another 300 to 400 million dollars in overruns. So on the one hand, we have people who are complaining about overruns, yet saying to us, incur more overruns. The debt issue is obviously real, it's obviously a concern. But I want you to I want to emphasize this. The difference in this kind of debt, and myself and Minister Marshall have sat down for you, how can we explain this in a, uh, in a non-economic way? And I don't know if there's any such thing as good debt and bad debt, but I, I guess the, the difference is if you own your home or you're paying a mortgage or you're, you're uh, renting an apartment, well, you're, you're uh, <coughs> generating revenue. You can take that same money and you can go have a great vacation in the Bahamas and. At the end of the day, you'll pay for it, but other than a good time, you're not going to have anything to show for it in the future. Muskrat Falls will generate enough revenue. That $232 a month I talked about will generate enough revenue, approximately $175 million in the first number of years, up to $350 million to pay for everything. To pay for the um, return on equity to the province, to pay on the operations, to pay on the capital costs, pay on debt financing, so that we will then be left with a, an asset that will be good for 100 years. And that's why utility companies use the 50-year period of 2017 to 2067. So what we're doing, I would suggest we're investing in the future. We're looking at pro providing the power that we need, providing power for mining developments in Labrador, and meanwhile, we will own assets. The maritime link will be returned at the end of 35 years along with the block of power, and then we'll own a $1.2 billion asset and have our power back. Closing Holyrood is the equivalent of taking 300,000 cars off the road. And we haven't really heard a whole lot other than the people from Holyrood last week. But just think about that. Burning 18,000 barrels of oil a day, reducing greenhouse gases by more than a million tons annually. Even with a $600 million upgrade to Holyrood, it doesn't reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So where are we? We're getting ready. Uh, we're waiting for the PUB report. 
We're looking forward to the House of Assembly. And for all of the critics out there who say, you know, we, we should be in the House earlier, well, I can assure you that next week we're ready, and anyone who has any questions on Musgrave Falls, bring it up. And I'm sure that my colleagues will say the same. The opposition will have the opportunity to debate Musgrave Falls. And you know what's very important about that? It didn't take place with the upper church. There was no debate in the House of Assembly. I've actually looked at Hanser. It came in. There was very little debate in public. Then we will have finalized the loan guarantee, have finalized the deal with Amira. Now CORE will bring in its final numbers. We will have a better idea of overruns and costs. And prior to the sanction, we will have all of these numbers in our possession. So I, I began today by asking two simple questions. Again, just keep these in mind. One, we need the power. And two, Muscat Falls is the least cost alternative. Sometimes, and my, my colleagues will tell you, and Sandy's been around a little bit longer than, than Gwen, but Ross is the, the aged veteran of, uh, of, uh, of our group. Sometimes the easiest thing for politicians to do is do nothing. Why would we, why would any of us, why would Premier Kathy Gunderdale want to do a bad deal? What is in it for us to simply plow ahead with a deal that doesn't make sense? I can assure you, I have no emotional attachment to Muscat Falls. I look at this as objectively as I can. I look at it with a view to what can we do today to benefit our children and grandchildren in the future, knowing that there's always uncertainty and risk. So we can leave Muscat Falls and say, OK, too much heat from the critics. Let's leave it to someone else to do. But that's not how Premier Dunderdale and our government operate. We have a vision for the future of this province. And we want to use our oil revenues to create a renewable resource economy. It doesn't mean that we forget about the importance of our fishery and our forestry and everything else that goes on. It simply recognizes that we have a wonderful opportunity at present to use our natural resources to build our schools, our hospitals, our roads, and to provide for a future. Our energy plan looks to 2041 with the return of the Upper Churchill. And it is that Upper Churchill deal, make no mistake about it, which hangs like a specter over Muskrat Falls. Well, we must be, learn from the mistakes of the past. As politicians, we can't be paralyzed by fear of making a decision. For those who are elected as leaders must lead, that's what we are elected to do. And that's what we will do. In a recent speech last week, I think it was, at the University of Miami, President Obama stated, quote, and he was talking about the need for energy in the, in the United States. So we need all of you to keep at it. We need you to work hard. We need you to dream big. Close quote. And that's what we are doing. Thinking big to ensure a future for our children. The development of the Upper Church has been debate, debated for over 40 years. It's time to make a decision. How many reports do you need? The critics say, well, we need another independent report. Well, independent doesn't mean that Muscat Falls is not a good deal. That's what they're looking for. Vic Young, the chair of Newfoundland Labrador Hydro, or Newfoundland Hydro, I guess, at the time, in 1980, recommended that the province proceed with Muscat Falls in 1980. Here we are, 32 years later, still talking about it. As a province and as a people, we have never been stronger or better financially positioned to move forward with the development of Muskrat Falls. <clears throat> As Ed Martin, the president and CEO of Nalcor, said recently at the PUB, the stars are lining up. So in deciding whether or not to sanction Muskrat Falls, we will be guided by one basic principle, doing what is best for the people of Newfoundland and Labrador. And, and in the first two speeches I gave on this issue, I didn't close with this line. And based on what I know today, I have no problem in concluding that Muskrat Falls is in the best interest of the people of this province. Now, thank you very much, everyone. I think there's, if there's a, if anyone has a couple of questions or anything, I'm certainly uh, open to it. I have a question, Mr. Kennedy, far be it for me to leave without a question. Uh, 
2017 is a popular date in Newfoundland and Labrador. We have Hebron, we have Muskrat Falls, and I know that you're saying well, this might be an exercise in navel gazing, is to say that this is the right way to go. But one of the things that I think that has been lost in the whole debate, and it was raised yesterday at the Hebron uh, presentation, skilled workers. We've got these two mega projects, plus Valley mm -hmm. Plus, coming online. And we have never heard comment from the government yet in terms of where are we going to get the capacity to build the projects. And if you talk about economic development and development of Newfoundland, that's important. Okay, there's two answers. One, the, the first one is that the Premier uh, saw fit during, during the, after the last election to create a department solely devoted to advanced uh, skill and labor workforce. I, I always get the name uh, uh, confused, but it's to deal with the workforce issue. Secondly, and what I'm told by a lot of our workers out west, is that they want, they will come home if there are not only a project, but a number of projects which allows for an extended period of, of work. Secondly, or thirdly, I guess we're talking about now, is that the wages have to be comparable. And what we're seeing is the wages, especially when you have the uh, special uh, order on, on Hebron, for example, and there will be one for Muskrat Falls, where there's no uh, guarantee, no strike, no, uh, mm -hmm. no lockout. The wages will be uh, comparable. We're working on, and I met with the uh, Building Trades Council myself in the recent past. Minister Burke is, is meeting with people, and we're looking at getting more apprentices into the system. Uh, will we find all the workers we need? I, I, I don't know the answer to that. But I'll say one thing. Isn't this a much better position to be in today than what we were in 10 years ago? Who ever thought we'd, see, we'd reach today Newfoundland and Labrador where we couldn't find enough workers? In other words, we have too many jobs. Now, we want our own people. That's the, 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 the key part of the Hebron Benefits Agreement with other benefits agreements. We want opportunities for Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. In the Lower Churchill, in the New Dawn Agreement, there will be benefits for the uh, Inu first, or the Aboriginal peoples, then other residents of Labrador, the residents of the island. So there's good and bad with it all. It's a complicated issue, but we're hoping that a lot of our people will want to come home once they see that Hebron, you go from Hebron to, uh, to Muskrat Falls, and of course we have uh, the confirmed building of one of the modules in, uh, in uh, Marysville. Go ahead. Um, in Labrador, we have the Muskrat Falls, few climbers up there's Gull Island as well. Gull Island has potential to be in the larger of the two projects from my understanding. That's correct. So what was the decision made to develop a smaller project instead of saying we need a better return out of Gull Island? If you look at it again, go back to this 1980 report by Vic Young. He talks about the development of the Lower Church. We've always looked at the Lower Church as one project comprised of two components being the Gull Island, which has approximately 2,000, 2,200 megawatts of power, and Muskrat Falls, which has 824. Right now, our power needs, what we're looking at with Muskrat Falls, is satisfying domestic needs. The need for power on the island, opening up our markets in the, in the uh, Maritimes in the, in the U.S., hopefully, but also providing power for Labrador. Gull Island could be too big at present. But if we could perceive a go on, we would. The difficulty is getting across Quebec. What the reason that the Upper Churchill, or one of the reasons the Upper Churchill turned out to be such a bad deal, is we had all of this power, that 5,400 megawatts of power, and nowhere to go. Joey Smallwood actually looked at, back in 64, 65, the, what's called the Anglo-Saxon route. So what we're calling the Labrador Island Link is the route that was looked at back in the 60s, but wasn't seen to be feasible. We can't get across Quebec. The federal government, uh, there's no national energy policy or energy agreement which allows us. In fact, uh, until such time as an agreement is reached with Quebec, and sooner or later, there will be an agreement. It could be a, a decade out, but sooner or later, there will be an agreement because 2041 is approaching, and Quebec is dependent on upper Churchill power. That's how simple it is. We have not been able in 40 years to reach agreement. else? Thank you very much everyone and uh, have a good day.
I guess we can all uh, certainly join in thanking the minister. It was a uh, very informative uh, presentation, and hopefully we're all a little more enlightened when we leave than when we came here. Minister, if you'd like to come back up, we do have a token of appreciation here on behalf of the paper. I hope it's not a car who's uh, <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Although with some Mr. Mr. Wise, we couldn't make a bet as to who would have to wear the other jersey. But I'll, I'll, I'll pass on that for now. Oh, we have this. And he's passed on the bet about wearing the jersey. Yeah. <laughs> for now. <laughs> Pretty safe bet here. <laughs> What we have for the minister is a, uh, a copy of our Christmas ornament to the chamber. And just as a information piece, our new ornament for 2012 is almost finalized. And we would hope to be able to unveil it soon in one of our next uh, luncheons, so stay tuned. But for now, Minister, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And one last thing before we leave, I call upon our past president, Greg Pippen. He has a little presentation to make to Paul Dilley. What they do now? And it's not for asking the first question. Oh, <laughs> darn. Just take a minute. Uh, the last couple of folks have been trying to get Paul, give Paul a little gift. Paul took it by himself to fix our sign, cost new flat power. He, he put chains all the wood, he painted it, redid it, and you probably look at it, probably for duct tape going Paul. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it was, it certainly that was a you know, complete volunteer effort. As a matter of fact, I think he even did his own stuff that long. So we really appreciate it. And the last couple of times we wanted to give Paul a token of our thanks. He hadn't been able to make it. So Paul, today, we finally got you. So I want to say thank you for your efforts and putting together our song. Oh, thank you. I, I should add that the, the college the college was behind this as well because I got the carpentry shop people to make the new parts. So. <laughs> So thank you once again for coming out, and hopefully we'll see you all with two or three friends each next month for the next lunch. Thank you.